Now, when we're coaching a sort of managerial executive level, what we're really doing is helping somebody reflect in a very structured way. You know, the skill of the coach is to be an expert, to go, there's a hundred things you can reflect on, but I can already see that these are the one or two areas that will have the biggest impact. The question is, from Thinking Focus. Hi, I'm Ricky. Hi, I'm Paul. And today, the question is, why is reflection important in the workplace? Mm. Right. So no, start one. I want to think about that. Uh, <laughs> you want to reflect? Yeah. Give me a moment. Well, while you're reflecting, let me tell the listeners, we're trying to do something a little bit different on this particular episode. I wanted to tap into our resident psychologist, which if you hadn't gathered, is Paul, who's busy reflecting right now. Um, and of course, at, at the time of year we're recording, which is in the run up to Christmas, it's kind of a natural break point where we kind of switch off, particularly in the in the Western world, we switch off and we start to think about the year that we've had um, and we think ahead. So, Paul, what is reflection, first of all, and why is it important, particularly in the workplace? Right. So we're not talking about mirrors here. No. But we, but we kind oh. of are. In Have we way. got to start again with your reflection now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why is reflection important? Well, it's not if you're a vampire. Um, <laughs> reflection, in essence, is that point when we stop and think and try and draw learning and meaning from the things that have happened. And the reason it's really important is because that's how we learn and grow. And it's almost the only thing we can do to learn and grow. You know, in, in some ways... You know, we'll go through life and we'll learn a lot of things, but that creates knowledge. It's the point we reflect on it that creates understanding and therefore we can build on it and build skills. So you think about this from a business perspective. How many businesses have you seen where, you know, they'll be looking at a problem in the workplace and they'll tell you all of the things that are going on all of the reasons that problem's happening, all of the kind of nuances that it creates. And they understand it really deeply. And yet they're still carrying on doing the same old things and allowing the problem to happen. And reflection is the difference between that, I get it, I understand it, and, oh, no, I really get it. I need to do something about it. I need to be different because of it. Well, I think I think that's it. that's really interesting because there are multiple layers to this. Then, from what you've just described, layer one is, you know, I've been on a course, for example, and if I don't reflect, we know that knowledge Ebbinghaus effect. The knowledge is yeah. lost within a week if we are not, um, if if we don't apply it, if we don't put it into practice in some way, which again is a form of of reflecting that says, what did I learn? And is that how it plays out in reality? Yes. And I think, um, you know, if you're in a professional body, most professional bodies know this and therefore, you know, they, they cause you to have to do some reflection. So, you know, lots of professional bodies now talk about continuous professional development and they talk about evidencing that and keeping learning logs and keeping reviews. I'm doing a program at the moment, uh, um, you know, after every module, I have to write a reflective statement. You know, I have to write a page or two pages about what that module meant and how it affects my my practice and what I'm going to do with it. They're not doing that to go, were you listening? They're doing that because the key learning from that module happens in me working out how to write that document. They're forcing reflection. Because our, our friend, uh, Paul Matthews, who's big in the learning space, he talks about this learning stack, which is built on reflection, isn't it? Where, yeah. you know, yes, you might journal something or you might share it with somebody else. And, and in the workplace, the most logical person is with your line manager. And one of the challenges, I imagine, is time. Um, but he builds that up to actually the highest form of reflection is being in a position where you can teach it. And I think you're necessarily lay... teaching it, but be in a position to teach it. Yes. Well, I think it's working out how to teach it that's the reflective activity, yeah, not yeah, the yeah. teaching it bit. So if I could just lesson plan and never actually do any training, that would be great from now on. <laughs> um, but, 
But I think, I mean, you think that, just relate that to coaching for a second. Now, when we're coaching at a sort of managerial executive level, what we're really doing is helping somebody reflect in a very structured way. And, uh, you know, the skill of the coach is to be an expert to go, there's a hundred things you can reflect on, but I can already see that these are the one or two areas that will have the biggest impact. So I'm going to ask questions in that way. What I find really fascinating is it's also reflective for the coach because every time we go through that, we get better at working out what are the one or two areas, what are the things that, that are going to make the biggest difference. So you know, coaching is a really powerful reflective activity for the coach and the coachee. So what's the connection then between the activity and the change in behavior? How does that, how does that manifest itself? Well, in essence, what reflection is doing, these, I, I, I don't know the research on this, but I'm, so I'm slightly guessing here, but it, it, it's taking a load of things you know and attaching them to your understanding of the world to make them accessible and useful. It's kind of, it's kind of making the connections in your mind about how all these things work and fit and, um, and, and making decisions about how you're going to use it. So it's kind of bringing to life knowledge bringing to life experience in a way that makes it accessible and usable and it's this this ability to kind of go that didn't work so to your example earlier nobody's stopping to go that's not working we'll carry on actually yeah. it's the go pause and okay so how might we do that different which is i suppose really closely aligned to the purposeful and disciplined practice that Anders Ericsson talks about in yep. in peak it, it all comes back to a a pause moment that says so i got this result doing this how might i get a different result doing that yeah and 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 going how do i take this experience and integrate it into my next action which is a learning moment what does that look like then practically in terms of techniques? Well, the first, the first thing I want to say here, because it just comes up a lot in the work that we do, is that people treat this like it's a big, big thing. You know, the amount of times people have said to me, yeah, yeah I get all that, but we just don't have time to stop and reflect. <laughs> but you have, you have time to keep balls in it up, though. Yeah, yeah. And you go, well, firstly, I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. I think you don't have time not to stop and reflect because time's quite precious but also you're imagining it being a massive thing you know that we need to take a week out and reflect and and I, I just don't think that's true i think you can stop and reflect in moments you know it, it's not it's not how long you spent on it and actually I, I think sometimes the constraints of doing it in small amounts of time probably actually focus the reflection and make it better so i think if you had a day to reflect you probably would wander all over the place and reflect on a whole load of stuff that you know you do a lot of navel gazing in a day if you sat down at the end of a project and went right 30 minutes what's the key learnings out of that project well what differences do we need to make going forward i think that's probably more powerful it, it, it's interesting because i um, was asked to contribute to a LinkedIn um, question feed. They basically go out, they ask experts what they think. Um, and, somehow, and they asked you as well. And as somehow well. it dropped into my um, my line of questioning. But one of the things was impact uh, on training and what, what sort of things should you do? And I went, well, actually, if you just got the managers to reflect with the learner, the, the person coming back and get them to reflect in terms of what did they learn? So what does that mean to the way they do things every day? And what are they therefore going to do differently? That alone would start to move the needle. Yes, because you're forcing the reflection process. Yes. You're, you're kind of making it happen because, you know, what's the fastest, if I'm a line manager, what is the fastest way I can make one of my team reflect? Ask them a question. Questions are incredibly powerful. Brains have to answer questions. To even not answer a question, you have to think about the question. So you want to make somebody reflect, ask them a question. What did you learn from that? What was the most important thing that came out of that? And I, I love doing it when I'm working with people. I love doing it with constraints because if you say, tell me everything you learned, 
people will literally look at you and go, oh, yeah, I mean, you just big eyes at me right now. It's like, well, that's oh, pressure, panic. right? That's yeah. pressure. Well, what if I miss something? Yeah. If you go, what's the one thing that was amazing for you in that session? You know, I already got to find one thing. And, and even if I get it wrong, I can pretend I got it right. So I've, I've created a really safe way of reflecting. So I think, I think those kind of questions can be really powerful when managers, you know, um, get people to reflect. If you're a trainer or you're a coach, you can go slightly further because you can use your experience and skill to ask the right questions. So you can be very targeted with the questions because you go, actually, the thing I know you needed to learn out of that was X. So let me ask you a question about X because I'll force you to reflect in the right area. And you, you mentioned Anders Ericsson. That, for me, is the difference between deliberate and um, purposeful purposeful practice. The, the, you know, it is between somebody who can ask a question and somebody who can ask the most meaningful question. That's what yes. good coaches do in sport, in business. You know, and that, I suppose that's why a mentor is really valuable because they, they can be really, um, you know, laser-like in terms of getting you to efficiently think about the thing that's most valuable to you rather than your point of well tell me everything well no i want specifically on this thing what else how else who else type stuff there's something i learned watching sports coaches when they do this kind of activity where where you know good really good sports coaches go there are a hundred things that i can do to improve your performance my job is not about those hundred things it's about finding the one or two that will have the biggest impact from where you are right now on the game. And I'll focus you down onto those one or two. And when they're fixed, I'll pick two more. And then when they're fixed, I'll pick two more. But I'm never going to focus you on more than the one or two things at a time. And a really good sports coach will always pick the things that have the biggest impact, however obscure or irrelevant they may feel to you being coached. And I, I then try to reflect that back when I'm coaching salespeople, for instance. You go, I could start at the start of the sales process and go, let's reflect on your rapport skills with the customer or let's reflect on your closing skills. But the reality is if I can work out the thing they're screwing up the most and go, let's just focus on that. The fact, you know, the fact that they're not great at closing, if they're not building rapport, they're never getting to closing anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, and, yeah, and guess yeah. and guess what? If we get them to the point where they get rapport, they might meet a few customers that close themselves. So at least they're going to be selling more till we work out the closing <laughs> skills. Thing. Yeah. You know I'm I mean? doing it because I like you. Yeah. Okay, so we've covered a lot about some of the barriers and challenges of reflection. I.e., you know, we think it takes a long time and stuff. So, so how can individuals? How can they reflect? And how can they build it into their daily routine? Okay, so I think that there's two parts to that. So the how bit, you know, you know having some sort of structure or model to use to, to, to create a reflective practice. And I just want to say with that, it's like I'll give you the one we use because it's simple and easy and everyone can pick it up and I quite love it. Um, it's quite old. It came from a therapy-type environment from a guy called Borton. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, I think, it's, I think the papers on it are from the seventies, so it's not like a modern thing, but there are hundreds of these models, all kind of variants of the same thing. And if you have one you love, just go with that. Ours is not better or worse. It's just easy. And then we'll talk about daily routine stuff. So this model, um, starts with, sorry, it's three steps starts with the first step. Well, obviously starts with the first step. All things start with the <laughs> usually a good idea to start with the first one yeah yeah um so the first step so i'm really losing my train of thought there. <laughs> the first step is what what is it you're trying to um reflect on so be very specific because often we try and reflect on everything big topics you know you know so using the the work one i'd like to reflect on my sales skills is a massive topic. I'd like to reflect on my management skills. It's a massive topic. What about your management skills? So the more specific you are, the better the reflection is going to be because the more meaningful the reflection is going to be. So if you took the management one, for example, I'd like to reflect on my management skills. All right, what? Well, actually, I'd like to reflect on my motivation for my team members. Okay, cool. 
that's that's worth doing could we get any more specific actually i'd like to reflect on my motivation for this specific team member am i doing the right things to motivate them in the right way brilliant that's a nice what very specific very tight the more generic your reflection the weaker it will be the more specific your reflection the better the learnings will be because they're meaningful so be laser like with the what is what you absolutely say. and i also i'd also kind of go try and be real reflect on real things as opposed to what ifs and made ups because you'll connect to them better they'll mean more to you and you can then take the lessons of the reflection and connect them to something in your life whereas if you're reflecting on a what if where do you put it what do you do with it well even even taking your sales analogy that says after a sales call i might reflect on what went well what did i learn yeah um what else could i have asked type stuff yep um and that's you know again as a good you know, if you're if you're a sales manager and you're say out with people doing co travel type work, you know one of the things that you can do really powerfully to force that reflection is ask questions to create a very specific what. If you're sitting next to a salesperson and you watch something go wrong, then the questions you ask post you know post sale review, sitting in the car or whatever, it, are going to be about that thing that went wrong. Don't go oh. What what do you think was good in that call? Go <laughs> go. You know when he said this and you went oh, oh, oh panic. Yeah, what was going on there? Because <laughs> because that again is helping people reflect on the right thing. So start with a what. Get your yep. what sorted. Next question is so what. Think about the consequences. Think well, about bit, the possibility. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? So what? So what? Yeah. Well, it's what. So what? It's easy to remember. So you got what? So what? What did that actually mean? What what happened? What were the consequences? What what were the implications? What were the opportunities? Was it good? Was it bad? We're, we're presenting this like we reflect about the things that have gone wrong in your life, but you don't. You also reflect about the things that are going well because that's how you embed them and make sure they keep going well. So it could be the so what is, oh, actually, that was really good. I did this thing and it worked this time. You know, I had that that conversation with one of my team and that, that really worked for them. And I can see they they left really motivated and they're doing all the right things and they're being successful. So it's it's thinking about the consequences, the implications, the the opportunities. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for them? What does it mean for the situation? Okay. So we've got what? We've got so what? Have a guess what comes next. Oh. Can I answer or do you want to answer? Go on, you do it. Is it is it is it now what? It is now what? Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? What are the actions? What's the next step? Where are you going to take this? Because the point of reflection is to create some form of change. Now, the interesting thing about that is I think it's perfectly reasonable to go through that activity and go, "Mm, my now what is do nothing. Uh, I can live with the consequences or I'm happy with the way it's going or I just continue with what it is. But at least I've made an active choice about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's really important to do the now what, even if the answer is now what? Nothing. So that's kind of a model of reflection. And there are hundreds of them out there with multiple different steps. Almost all the ones I've ever seen basically are variants of, I think, of those three steps. They're just breaking bits down and saying, well, actually, in the what, do this, then that. Or in the so what, think about this, then this, then this. So, so if you've got one you like, just stick to it. So that's that's the kind of model of reflection. How do you make it part of your life, little and often? I've got one that I've come across recently, which I really love. Um, so it's a really simple way of reflecting. Three things on three things. So sit at regular points of time, yeah, maybe once a week. I mean, you could do it daily, but once a week's probably enough. Probably no more than once a month, otherwise you're not doing it enough. And just go, right. Thinking back over the last period, I want to come up with three things on these three things. So the first of the three things are, what are my successes? The second of the three things are, what are my key learnings? And the third of my three things are, what are my priorities now going forward? Oh, that feels familiar. So three things on three things, success, learning, priorities. So if you just sat down once a week and went, right, let me think about last week. What were my three big successes? Oh, that was good. That was good. That was good. Uh, what are my three learnings? Oh, that's interesting. 
That's interesting. Need to think a bit more about that because there's something in that. Uh, what are my three priorities for next week? All right, sort this problem out. Go and work on that customer thing. Land this project. That feels a bit what so what now what to me. Yeah, it probably is. I mean, it's probably where it's come from. <laughs> Again, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd never, I'd never kind of dawned on that before I, uh, uh, before I now. But yeah, it probably is. But again, it's just unlike all these techniques, it, it, it's make it easy, make it simple, make it regular. You know, there are going to be some weeks where you sit down and go, "What were my successes last week?" <laughs> I had an okay meeting with so-and-so and yeah, I went to that nice restaurant on Tuesday. You know, it's the, the really weak things, but just get to three to remind yourself that there were some good things. There are going to be other weeks where you go, oh yeah, landed that project. Presentation to the boss was awesome. I'm going to get that. Pre-. You know, there's some weeks where it's going to be amazing and there's some weeks where it's going to be weak, but it doesn't matter. Just continually do it. You don't need them all to be incredible. You don't need to have every week where you learn some life shattering thing. You don't need to every week have three priorities that are going to change the world. You just need to have something. And some weeks it'll be big and some weeks it'll be small, but always moving forward. Okay. Because it sounds to me like we've just um, addressed perhaps some of the blockers and challenges around reflection so i don't have enough time um it, it's complex i don't know how to do it um yeah well actually you know you use either your three times three or your what so what now what and actually by lasering in on the key issue actually means that you're going to be a bit more expedient in terms of how you approach that and and you might start to increment or improve performance over time so imagine if you did this as you you prescribe little and often make it easy well you can't get easier than what so what now what surely um and actually it's really simple to do ticks that box um and it's going to have such an impact and if you're a manager it's going to have a massive impact on your people because you're going to cause them to take what they do every day, what they learn every day, and start to improve that and embed that elsewhere. Yeah. And if you think about, you know, it's always sort of the the mindset we have often as managers is we're looking for the finished product. We're looking for an overnight success, somebody to come from nowhere to amazing. But if you look at the story of every overnight success, it's a very long period before they're an overnight success where they learn how to be an overnight success by just getting slowly better day in, day out. You know, every musician that appears out of nowhere didn't appear out of nowhere. They didn't pick up the guitar yesterday and happen to fall into a multi-platinum album. They were gigging for years. You just didn't know about it. Yeah, well, even Lionel Messi didn't, he didn't arrive in whatever form he arrived um, as the finished article. There was lots of practice, there was lots of coaching, lots of support, lots of yeah. feedback loops, all of those things that enabled him to become what he is now, clearly with natural talent aligned to it too. Great example. That's a great example. I, I remember hearing once a talk sport conversation uh, and their conversation was, who is the greatest footballer? Is it Messi or Ronaldo? And lots of people phoned up and went, it's got to be Ronaldo because he's had to work at it. Messi hasn't. And I kind of went, that is the most disrespectful thing you've ever heard about Messi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The difference is he doesn't tell you he's doing it. But there is no way he got that good by just turning up one day, kicking a ball and going, oh, didn't know I could do that. You know, what you're watching is 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 reflection and improvement and coaching day in, day out working at it you know he's he i bet you if you could sit him down and go talk us about some of those key points in your career there'll be points when he was a kid and probably even as an adult where he's had to go i'm no good at this bit and then go right what am i going to do about it right i'm going to go and do this skill 500 times and if i fall over fall over 499 so be it i'll just do it in private so i don't look a wally yeah and i think i think that's really interesting that you go 
reflection on its own is not going to change anything, which is why the now what is so important. It's that call it's to action point. that says, so I've learned all of this stuff. Now what will I do with it? You know, yes. whether it's a technical change in terms of the way I do something, um, whether it's an, a, acquiring more knowledge or depth on a particular topic or subject, or, you know, socializing that with others to go, well, what do you think? And how do I broaden my perspective? So if you think of it like this, getting the what right is creating focus. Am I actually focused on the right things? Because I could be reflecting on complete irrelevant bits. The so what bit is about getting why and purpose. You know, do I care about it? The now what is a commitment to action. Well, you know, if we were talking about goal setting or business planning, what would we be talking about? Yeah, you'd talk about those three things, wouldn't you? We would talk about focus. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we strangely in a lot of these things always end up back in the same place. So let's kind of bring this to a nice, neat end then. Imagine I'm brand new to this, this concept of reflection. What three practical things would you suggest for me and our listeners to go do? Okay. So I'm imagining you're brand new to this process of reflection. Yes. Are you reflecting on that question? I am thinking about it. And and so, so this is what I'd like to do. I'd go, so what is it that I've talked about in this podcast today, Ricky, that struck you the most? Oh, um, well, for me, I think the, the realization that this doesn't have to take long um, and that, that what, so what, now what structure really crystallized that. Um, you know, because saying it doesn't have to take long is one thing, but showing me how to do it, that's that's the crucial bit here for me. So what what is it you've taken from that? What what's what why did that connect with you? Because it means that there's the barrier to doing this that I create in my mind that this is going to take all the time and I've got a team of 10 people and all of those things. I'm thinking about, you know, my days as a manager, you go, how am I going to fit all that in? Well, you've just made it really easy because if I can focus on one thing and ask those three questions, I am, I'm going to get you to realize and move forward in one fell swoop. Last question. So what are you going to do differently now? You know that. It's put it into action. It's to start looking for opportunities with uh, where I can ask those questions. And for us, in practical terms, for me, it's with each other as a team, but also with our clients that says, you know, what, so what, now what, um, and helping them to get those incremental marginal gains that will move them forward, move the needle for them. I lied. It wasn't my last question. This is oh. my last question. Did you see what I did there? Are you asking me or the listeners? Well, everybody. Because they're going to have to comment now in order to yeah. work out. And we'll know who's been listening to the end. But more interesting, did you see that we just did what, say what, now what? Yeah, I did. I did. Subtle. Subtle. It yeah. wasn't lost on me. Cool. And that that's my point here. That's that's my biggest reflection. My biggest point here is it's not hard. It's not complex. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be flashy. But you do have to stop and do it for it to work great point to finish on thank you paul as our resident psychopath uh, psychologist psychologist sorry the question is from thinking focus thanks for listening if you enjoyed that then you're gonna love our sister podcast leading to here leading to here is interviews with everyday relatable leaders people just like you and me who have big jobs working as leaders in all sorts of companies across the world these unsung heroes share their stories, the ups and downs of being a leader, the lessons they've learned along the way, and those all-important secrets to success. You can find Leading to Hear on your usual podcast platform. To find out how Thinking Focus can unlock the potential within your organisation, go to www.thinkingfocus.com, where you'll discover more about the work we do, helping our clients increase productivity and enable change.